everybody, uh, I'm Jen Zajek. I work at uh, Catalyst IT. Um, I am one of those horrible front-end web developer people. Uh, I was in a former life, a back-end dev, doing a little bit of Django, but that was quite a few years ago now. I think that was Django 1.1, so showing my age here. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, integrating JavaScript uh, into uh, Python web frameworks. Now, uh, for the last year of my life, I've been working at Catalyst on a big uh, project for uh, a government ministry. Uh, and we've been building that in Django 1.4 uh, with uh, AngularJS. So that's my particular uh, expertise. But I'm going to try and keep this talk today a little bit more general, um, just on some kind of common pitfalls and gotchas you might run into when you're integrating any JavaScript with any Python. Why do we want to use JavaScript at a Python conference? Um, I guess my point here is that for all that uh, JavaScript is a much maligned language, uh, it does have its uses and it can be used well as well. Um, it's great at communicating with the DOM. And if you're doing web development, communicating with the DOM is kind of something that you're going to be doing a whole bunch. Um, so particular reasons for wanting to use JavaScript. Uh, one reason might be that you're looking to take some of your uh, computation and offload that to the client. That one's a little bit borderline, in my opinion. Um, as much as I use JavaScript day in, day out, it's slow. So think very carefully about making that argument for why you'd like to use JavaScript. Um, a much better reason is to make your site or your application, uh, your phone app, whatever, much more responsive. And what I mean by that is the ability to uh, make updates to your page uh, without having to go back to the server for a full page reload. Uh, the ability to do things behind the scenes. Uh, and say, for example, you've got um, uh, a search on your site that's going to give the user a list of search results, and you want the user to be able to sort those search results. Uh, the old school way of doing it is to have them click on a button that says, OK, I'd like to see these in the reverse order now. And you go away to your server. Your server will do your SQL query, return everything back to the browser in the opposite direction. Uh, with JavaScript, you can just say, OK, I just want to reorder these DOM nodes. That's much more straightforward. And the user can see it happen straight away, unless you've coded it really, really, really sloppily. OK. so. Um, Taking it as a given that you do want to use a bit of JavaScript, um, how can we use it um, to, to actually augment our site? Um, well, there's a couple of different things. Uh, one is you might want some light interactivity. That's kind of the scenario I just described of wanting to sort some search results. Or perhaps you've got one form on your website and you think, oh, it'd be really neat if I could tell the user that they're totally messing up their email address as they're typing it. Um, and I, for that, I'd just say stick with the tried and true, which I'm assuming everybody knows how to do, which is to use something like jQuery, Mutual, something like that. Um, there are a whole bunch of plugins out there, and you're not going to have to waste too much time. You can just drop and go with those. However, if you are wanting some more um, sophisticated behavior, some app-like behavior, something more akin to uh, using a desktop application on your website, um, then you are probably going to want to look at using a JavaScript framework. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to pin down a, yes, you really need to use a JavaScript framework because you're doing blah kind of reason. There's a whole bunch of different factors that are going to tip you over that line. Uh, for myself, for the application that I've been working on, I decided it was a good idea that we use the JavaScript framework because um, we really needed the templating to be able to swap strings in and out of the page in a nice um, modular way without making it really messy using something like jQuery. Uh, and also um, the ability to have 
different actions on the page which the user can undertake seamlessly and uh, you know there's commu constant communication with the server and the user isn't held up waiting for a page reload. Okay, so let's take that more complicated case. I want to use a JavaScript framework, um, of which there are many, and because this is a Python conference, I'm not going to go into which JavaScript framework could you use, because that's stupid. But um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been using AngularJS. There are all kinds of things out there, like um, Backbone, um, Ember, you name it. It's a very young um, part of the development community, and there are new frameworks coming out every day. So what kind of things do I need to think about to Im implement my JavaScript framework um, to get it to work nicely with my Python framework? OK, so here's one real simple gotcha that might trip you up early on. A lot of J JavaScript libraries use curly braces as their um, templating pattern. So you say, OK, here's my variable. And I'm going to say that this is a variable that you need to care about and interpret by wrapping it in curly braces. Unfortunately, a slight hiccup in that is that a lot of Python libraries also use that pattern. So you can see what's going to go wrong here. The, the Python is going to look through my template and say, OK, that's a Python variable. Wait, I can't find that variable. What's that one? And it's all going to go pear-shaped. That's not going to happen all the time. There's a bunch of um, uh, Python templating that's going to be fine just out of the box. Um, things like Mako and Chameleon. Um, tend to use that uh, dollar single curly brace pattern, you're not going to have any issues there, although I personally find those quite ugly as templating languages. However, some of the big gorillas uh, are not going to be that fine. Um, Ginger2 uses curly braces, and Django's templating uses curly braces, that, that double curly brace, uh, and also Bottle simple, simple Template Engine. Fortunately, there are ways around this problem. Um, except for Simple Template Engine, I just reached a brick wall on that one and had to give up. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, Bottle does let you plug in other templating engines fairly trivially. So basically, just don't use Simple Template Engine. It's not sophisticated enough. So Ginger2 um, has this concept of a raw block. So if you've got any, um, any kind of markup, anything that you don't want the Python uh, templating engine to evaluate, you just wrap it in that raw and end raw. And very similarly, um, Django 1.5 and obviously 1.6, which is coming out soon, has this concept of a verbatim block. And again, you just wrap uh, whatever you don't want to be evaluated in that verbatim block. That's really nice and simple. Uh, if you're still on Django 1.4, like uh, I have been for the last year or so, it's not quite as straightforward. This is a really nasty hack. Just use Django 1.5 if you're starting a new project. But if you're stuck on something older, this might get you out of a sticky situation. You can create your own custom template tag to take a value and spit it back out with some curly braces. That's fun. OK, so a better solution, if you're stuck with that, um, is uh, a lot of these JavaScript frameworks do let you use um, partial templates. So that's kind of its own um, file. It's a separate HTML file that the JavaScript framework you are using will go away and fetch, and your Python's not going to see it at all. Um, in fact, you can even go beyond that, forget about partial templates, don't have any Python templates at all. I haven't quite gone that far, but I can see for some purposes that might be, that might be the right thing to do. So partial JavaScript templates, um, because they aren't templates that your Python code is having to run through and evaluate, you should keep them with your other static files like your CSS and your HTML. Uh, sorry, in the JavaScript files. Um, quite often, you'll be able to nest those and um, do all kinds of crazy things with them, use different snippets. Um, they're quite sophisticated um, engines for that. Uh, there is one uh, issue, which is uh, if you are using IE, I think it's 9 and below, um, you have to make sure that your static files um, 
are hosted on the same domain uh, that your JavaScript is, that your site is on. Otherwise, you're going to hit um, cross-origin resource sharing issues, where basically the browser is going to say, it looks like you're trying to load in something dodgy from another site, so I'm going to forbid that, um, which is, I guess, kind of useful, but not really in this in this case. Um, so just, just watch out for that. If you are planning to package up your static files and put them on a different domain, you may encounter issues with earlier IEs. Uh, so this is just an example of a partial template. That, um, so this is my uh, Django template file that's sitting in my templates directory. It's got a form in it that's going to submit back to a, a Django view. Um, it's got my lovely um, CSRF token in there so that I'm nice and secure. And uh, I'm going to include with my Angular expression, that's that ng include bit up there, uh, a file from my static um, resources directory. Um, and I'm even going to do something a little bit cheeky and pass in a little bit of initialized data. So the ng init is part of my Angular code. And I'm passing in um, something from Django, which is my variable. So if you're doing this partial template malarkey, or maybe you've ditched templates altogether, where's my data coming from? Uh, and the answer to that is quite simple. I hope you've all worked out already. That is, we use a lovely RESTful API. Um, why this might be a good idea is you get a nice separation of concerns. So you've got more layers, logical layers in your code. You've got your data layer. You've got your API. And then you've got your pretty templates and so forth running on top of it and any interaction with the user. Um, it's easy to cache it aggressively. So you get some nice performance um, things from that. And uh, it, uh, most importantly, it's, it's a standard pattern that people understand. Um, this might um, pay dividends for you if you end up having a third party wanting to talk to your API, it's something everybody's going to be able to understand. And because it's standard, a lot of JavaScript frameworks have um, the ability to talk to REST services just kind of out of the box. So API libraries. Um, a bunch of these are Django ones, because obviously Django is kind of the Python framework for what it's worth. Um, TastyPy is very actively developed, and that's it's quite powerful. That's what we're using on the application that I'm working on at the moment. It does have some funny conventions. You have this whole dehydrate and rehydrate your resources scenario. So it can take a little while to grok that. Um, the Django REST framework is really nice up and coming one. It's got nice documentation. That would probably be my recommendation. Uh, Django Piston is a bit older now. I don't think it's quite as actively developed. Um, I've never used Flask, but I found this uh, Flask RESTful um, on GitHub, and that's pretty neat. And uh, MIME render in EVA a bit more specialized. Uh, alternatively, you can just roll your own. Like I say, REST is really well understood. If you've got some specific scenario that you just want to do something lightweight and quickly, you can just make your own. Um, I believe Web2Pi and CherryPy have got some of that, some helpers to get you most of the way there. Um, or you can just you know, write your own views. It's not hard. Um, if you're using Django, the one thing I'd say is um, do use um, class-based views um, as opposed to the normal views. They're just going to make that um, pattern of um, gets and puts and posts and so on a bit easier. OK, so that's kind of the real structured part of my talk. Um, this is just a few kind of a grab bag of other issues I've bumped into um, as I've gone along. Uh, you should, this is important, watch out for features uh, doing crazy things that you don't realize are happening. Um, for example, a lot of these API frameworks have all kinds of helpful things like, yay, you want some XML as well as your JSON, don't you? Unfortunately, um, that can introduce some security flaws. You may have heard about Ruby's recent woes with YAML as, as a serialization format. Um, 
Turn stuff off unless you need it. Don't just go in with the defaults, please. Um, you saw in my earlier form example that I've got that uh, Django um, CSRF token, which is um, something that you need to send along to make sure you're secure. Um, if you are going to go for a fully RESTful, OK, I'm going to post my data from my JavaScript, you still need to worry about CRSF. Um, you still need to have some mechanism for making sure that um, your post is coming from where you expect it to come from. Uh, so, uh, Django actually has um, a facility to let you set um, your CSRF token as a header on your post. Um, and they even give you some example JavaScript in their documentation pages uh, to make sure that you can do that properly uh, and securely. Uh, this one tripped me up for... This is one of those problems where you bump into it and it... And later on, it just seems really trivial, but at the time, you're just kind of tearing your hair out and going, ah, this could break everything. We're going to have to start from scratch. Some JavaScript frameworks have opinions about trailing slashes. Uh, Angular does. I bet some others do as well. Um, Angular says, I'm going to strip off all the trailing slashes, which anybody who's worked with Django knows. Django really likes trailing slashes, and TastyPy really likes trailing slashes as well. So that makes things a bit interesting. Fortuitously, uh, Django and TastyPy are both mature enough that they have options in the settings that you can say, actually, we don't need to worry about that training slash. OK, uh, another big one. If you're putting a bunch of application logic in your JavaScript, test that stuff. This is important. Just because it's that lightweight JavaScript stuff that we used to make buttons go red when we click on them, if we're doing application logic, it needs to be tested. Um, and fortunately, there are tools to help you with that. Um, I would say look at Jasmine as a unit testing uh, framework for JavaScript. Um, and uh, yeah, you can use Selenium to integrate that with the rest of your tests. It's got a, a kind of a web based um, test runner. Uh, yeah, if you're going backwards and forwards between writing Python and JavaScript, it does help if you try and stick to the conventions of each language. It's going to help you kind of turn that switch off in your head to say, OK, I'm writing some JavaScript now. OK, I'm writing some Python now. Uh, just keep things nice and tidy. Um, use linters for your language to make sure that you're keeping up with conventions. Uh, yeah, so I've said use APIs. Um, but occasionally you're going to have a, a, a wee small bit of data that you're like, OK, it doesn't really make sense to make an entire API call to find out where my static files directory is. I still want that to be nice and dynamic so I can change that in my Django settings file, but I don't want to have to go into all the JavaScript um, files and update where the static files has moved to. Uh, and I don't want to do an API call to check. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can use um, data attributes in your Python template file, write out into a data attribute on something like the HTML tag or the body tag, the small, small chunk of data that you want to pass through. And then you can just um, scrape that with some JavaScript. So this is vanilla JavaScript. It's not any framework. Pretty straightforward. And that's what I've got. Thanks, everybody.